Welcome back to another edition of the Mindset Entrepreneur video podcast. I am your host, Mark Altman, and I am here with Michael Zaytunian, founder and director of Dispute Resolution Council, LLC. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Michael, I got to tell you, I was really excited to uh, talk with you today because I really admire people who follow their childhood passion. And I know one of the interesting things about you is that um, you didn't begin your law career until age 36. And the fact that you were able to adjust and follow your dreams, uh, you know, not necessarily when most people do that, uh, is, is phenomenal. So could you just talk a little bit about how that evolved? Sure. Um, you know, when I started out after school, I thought my first career was going to be law, but I got sidetracked into church work. Uh, church was a big part of my life growing up. Uh, serving others was always a part of our family and what we did. And so my first career was really as a layman, a trained layman, uh, in the Armenian church, which is a small Orthodox Christian church. Uh, and that, uh, that career led me to New York, uh, but it was uh, short-lived. And I reached a point where I went through teaching uh, some restaurant work, some writing, and eventually uh, settled back on what I thought I was going to do out of high school, which was go to law school. Well, and, I, and we're going to touch upon in a minute or two about the, the core values that have followed you throughout your career. But I know, you know, when you uh, stopped your work in the church to evolve into teaching at a business college and having that experience, it was then correct that it kind of reawakened, reawakened your love of law and kind of got you back in that mindset. Is that correct? Yeah, I was lucky enough to teach a business law class. And that uh, kind of refired the ideas and the, the thoughts I had about going into law and using that career as a way to serve others and a way to help them with uh, solving their problems. And I know, Michael, for you, you know, I mentioned the core values and I know whether it was at the church or in helping students achieve their dreams and taking the next step in their careers or working in the restaurant business and giving people good service. Whatever it was, it seems like supporting people, helping people, problem solving has just been with you since you've been young. Where, where do those values come from? I think they come in part from upbringing. My family, my father was always somebody that reached out to help people, uh, help them find jobs, help them get settled. Uh, helped them find their way. And uh, it was just a value that stuck with me. You know, my own spiritual walk uh, also led me to that, that life of caring and serving. Uh, and really translating that into the legal profession has been really challenging and, and, and really a nice way to uh, mold my practice in a way other than, you know, strictly civil procedure and following the, the rule of thumb of the law and that kind of thing. So I got to tell you, I, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and something I chuckled because um, I'm big on perception, how people perceive industries and people and businesses and so on and so forth. And when I saw that you help people avoid devastating litigation, I just chuckled to myself because if you are not, for our audience, if you are not experienced with the devastation litigation causes, take my word for it. It's devastating. So talk a little bit about the perception people have of law and conflict resolution and litigation and how painful that can be and what are some of the things you do to address those perceptions. Sure. And I, you know, I started out wanting to try cases and I was lucky enough to do that early on. Uh, and people have a very glamorous view from television and movies and talking to others about what a lawsuit and what litigation can be like. Uh, it is damaging. It is, it is tedious. It is cumbersome. Uh, it's not cost or time effective. Uh, and as a, just a natural problem solver, I looked at it and said, how can we solve people's problems in a way that quickly gets them to reach their goals and satisfy their interests and not be bogged down or you know, obstructed you know, by going through civil procedures and going through a litigation process that's not always as efficient uh, and as creative as it could be? Well, that was one of the things in learning more about you, Michael, that resonated with me. You know, I think there's a perception in law that lawyers try to drive up fees and they have their agenda and how they're going to approach. And I know you take a lot of pride in differentiating your company and that when you sit down with people and help them with this, you're more interested in what their needs are and what their end goals and results are rather than any agenda you have. So could you talk about that process a little bit? Sure. You know, I think there's also a perception that if you 
approach the problem in a non-adversarial way, uh, that it's not zealous advocacy, that it might be weaker or not as effective. And it's really a myth. Uh, we can be much more effective when we, from the very beginning of meeting that client and working, work with them, tailor the process, tailor how we're going to satisfy their needs to their situation. And that's what makes us different. You, you would walk in our office and the first thing we would want to look at is what are the factors that you bring to the table and how do we tailor the process so it best works with your situation? Bill uh, Belichick called, talks about situational football. Mm -hmm. This is really situational dispute resolution. Yeah. That's the right way to go about it. It's a great analogy. And, you know, what I think, what I think uh, Dispute Resolution Council LLC does such a great job of is, um, and it's not, this is not a terminology you hear a lot in the legal profession, is emotional intelligence. You know, in, in knowing that toughness is not a physical thing, it's really more of a mental and emotional thing. And, and when you say zealous advocate, I'll tell you, Michael, I think that is a term that I really want our audience to understand because when you're going through the process of choosing someone not just to represent you, but to support you, that zealous advocate term, what, what does advocate mean in your mind? What, how do you define advocate in your practice? Yeah, and the way I see my role is that of a counselor, a legal counselor. And counselor, just going back to you know, my scriptural days, is, is defined, the Greek uh, translation is someone who walks aside next to somebody and helps them, helps them guide them along their way. And that's really the advocacy that we use. It's really making sure that they're going the right way, that they're getting closer to their needs immediately and not being driven or um, you know, having to be subject to a process that's really not responsive to them. And I know uh, at your practice you have uh, two, un two unique approaches. One is, uh, maybe not as unique, but collaborative law is one of your approaches, and one is 3D mediation. So could you to educate our audience on what those two things involve? Yeah, they're both unique in the sense that a lot of times uh, people don't get to mediation until late in a litigation process. And what we want to do is get, is from, from the very beginning, be pursuing resolution. So 3D mediation is designed and structured to really work from the very beginning, not as part of litigation, not as something that lawyers turn to two or three years down the line, but right from the outset, designed for that situation through a series of meetings rather than one long full day mediation, which is the traditional model. Collaborative law is a structured negotiation process that's also designed to see the people working together, collaborating, the people in the dispute and their lawyers committed to that collaboration. When you're in that process, the lawyers and the clients agree at the outset, outset that they're not gonna litigate, they're not gonna file a lawsuit, but they're gonna work through a structured negotiation process that's designed to reach their needs and to satisfy those interests. So there's a real commitment involved in that process on all sides, right? Absolutely. That's great. And, and it sounds like your approach, which is so refreshing, is very preventative. You know, in, in going, dealing with it early on in a preventative way as opposed to reacting to what gets really bad and having to jump in. Is that accurate? It's preventive. It's, it's actually proactive. I mean, we, and I had a legal uh, colleague that once said the worst time to hire a lawyer is when you need one. <laughs> and, and I think it's so it's a great line. It's and so what line. we try to do is anticipate the problem, the situation, uh, design for that situation and focus on what are the what are the client's interests and goals and how do we get to them in the most efficient and creative way. So let's build on that. So let's talk about process. What have you seen are some of the common mistakes when people are choosing someone to help them in this area around dispute resolution uh, from the process perspective? What are, the, what are the mistakes you see made? I think they'll often go to a lawyer that's been recommended to them by someone, and they do find a lawyer that works in the right practice area, you know, for instance, an employment lawyer to do an employment dispute. But what they don't think about before they choose the lawyer is, what approach is this lawyer going to take? And I would want clients to ask and say, how are you thinking about approaching this dispute and resolving it in a way that makes sense for my situation? For a quick example, if you have uh, parties that have an ongoing relationships, whether it's a family business 
or partners or contractors and subcontractors, they want to work together in the future. So you want to make sure that your process is not going to damage that relationship. Litigation will damage it. Arbitration will damage it. But processes like collaborative law or early mediation won't. And that's just one of the factors you look at. You know, what is, what is the party's risk aversion? Do they want, if they're entrepreneurs, do they want to turn their decision-making over to a judge or a jury? Or do they want to hold on to the decision-making themselves? If they're that kind that wants to keep control over the decision-making, the process should be designed to meet that need. Well, I love what you said, and I, and I feel like referrals are always interesting because whether you're referring a doctor, a lawyer, a contractor, or whatever it is, when someone else refers someone to you, that means that person has met their personal expectations. But it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to meet yours. So it's important to be able to articulate what those expectations are in unison with what you're talking about because just because they're referred doesn't mean it's always the right way. So what would be, if, if, if someone's watching this and they're thinking that they're in the, maybe need to go down this route or they know someone who needs to go down this route, what are two or three things that if you're watching this that they should be aware of? If they're about to sit down with someone and you would say, okay, well, here are two or three questions I would ask if it were me. Mm -hmm. I, I think one thing that you'd want the lawyer to be asking them or them to be talking to the lawyer about is what are your goals at the end of this process when it's over? What do you want the result to look like? And what that, what that answer is should drive the process. Uh, and if it's not a process that that lawyer is doing, the lawyer really should, you know, should refer it out to someone who does it. I don't do arbitration and I do that by choice because arbitration takes the decision making out of the hands of the client and into the arbitrator's hands. But if I had a case come in and I said, you know, given these factors, it's right for arbitration, we need to then refer it to an arbitrator. We need to be big enough to do that. And one last point I want to make on this is I don't want it to get lost in the shuffle today when you talk about non-adversarial dispute resolution because that is what it's about. So um, that f I feel like for so many people, Michael, that seems so unattainable. You know, how many people are out there going, oh, yeah, non-adversarial dispute So how do you make the process? It's not seamless, right? But how do you make it less stressful, less overwhelming, because it does seem like a far goal for a lot of people. Yeah. And, you know, all disputes, all conflicts are, are emotional. And there is that adversarial component. It's not just ignoring that, but it's managing it. Sometimes the parties need to go through that conflict and engage in it a little more before they get to the point where their mind is ready to talk about, talk in a rational way about solutions. And so I think it's for us as lawyers to have the insight and the perception to say, how do we manage this process? How do we allow, maybe we allow that conflict to continue a little bit, play itself out. A lot of times people have the need to have their day in court, which really is, means they need to be heard. Right. And so that process has to give them that opportunity. Uh, statistically, trials don't do that because 97% of the cases that get filed in court settle. They don't go to trial. So you're never actually going to get that day in court. So again, it's incumbent on us to say, what are the needs here? Some of those needs are emotional. We have to meet them. Some of them are rational. So my final question for you today, Michael, is um, so much admiration for you as an entrepreneur. For those people out there who are in their 30s and 40s who are thinking about taking their career in a different direction, who are taking that plunge in the risk of being an entrepreneur, what advice would you give them? Um, how were you able to pull it off? And, and what, what advice did you get, perhaps, that allowed you to do it? I think, you, you know, you have to balance the practical with, with, you know, the idealistic and the passionate. But to a large degree, you have to be in a, a following a course where your real talent, you know, your real passion and your unique ability has to be tapped in what you're doing. If you're doing that, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to be good at what you do. And you're not going to mind spending a lot of time and effort working. Entrepreneurial work is not easy, as, as you know. A lot of time is spent doing things we don't particularly like doing. But, but it has to be done. But it still have to have that vehicle for, am I doing what I'm really good at and what I love doing? Well said. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. It was good to be here. Audience, thank you very much for joining us for another edition of the Mindset Go Entrepreneur Video Podcast. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.